Hello everyone, my name is Tony Rivas. I serve as president of the American Association for Cancer Research. And I want to thank you for joining us today for what I think is an extremely important and timely session. This is a frank and open discussion of racism and racial, uh, racial inequities in cancer research. The recent tragic events with the deaths of, among others, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ofma Dabry, and most recently, Richard Brooks, underscored the tragic persistence of racism and systemic injustice towards Black Americans in our country and people of color around the world. In response, the ACR issued a statement that took a strong stand against racial discrimination and inequality. We also express outrage and deep frustration with the structural racism and social injustices that have led to significant healthcare inequalities among racial and ethnic minorities. This is not about politics. This is not about policy. This is not about the particular incident or incidents. This is about who we are and how we interpret the scientific facts. As a melanoma oncologist, I know that skin color is an adaptation of skin melanocytes of our ancestors to different degrees of ultraviolet light exposure. But why does the skin color impact our lives and careers? Today, we will dig into issues about which we have kept quiet for way too long because it was too difficult or too painful to talk about them. As an organization focused on the conquest of cancer, whose core values include equality, diversity, and inclusion, the ACR is fully committed to talking on a much bigger, taking on a much bigger role in confronting and combating systemic racism and racial inequalities. For example, African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans are persistently underrepresented in training programs, and especially in senior faculty and leadership positions in academia, government, and industry. Further, racial and ethnic minorities continue to experience healthcare inequalities, including a disproportionate burden of cancer, and they are underrepresented in cancer research studies and clinical trials. Therefore, we need to stimulate an open and frank discussion about the current state of affairs in our field, which will help guide the various steps and initiatives that the ACR can take forward to advance social justice and eliminate racial inequality in all forms. ACR is dedicated and stands ready to take the necessary actions to change this unacceptable picture and achieve positive change now for the benefit of current and future generations. To address this compelling topic, we have assembled a distinguished panel of participants who represent the various sectors relevant to the cancer field, including academia, industry, government, and patient advocacy. We trust that our discussions today will result in new initiatives and policies, not only for the ACR, but also for the broader scientific community. The ACR is moving forward with plans for holding a series of forums on this important and timely topic and to publish informative blog posts and other communications on the subject. While we cannot take questions uh, from the audience to the, during this session today, we encourage you to share your comments in the chat box on the right side of the screen. We'll be taking these comments into account as the ACR works with a diverse membership to help create a world that achieves equity, unity, and justice for all. Now, it's my distinct privilege to introduce the panelists of today's dialogue. There are distinguished leaders working in various sectors relevant to cancer field. Starting alphabetically, Dr. John Carpton is the director of the Institute of Translational Genomics and professor at the University of Southern California, Keck School of Medicine. He's the chair of the ACR's Minorities in Cancer Research Council. Dr. Carpton served as program committee chairperson for the ACR 2019 annual meeting in Atlanta and co-chaired the ACR inaugural special conference on science of health of uh, cancer healthcare disparities. Dr. Marcia Cruz Correa is the director of gastrointestinal oncology division at the Dr. Isaac Gonzalez Martinez Oncologic Hospital and is professor at the University of Puerto Rico Comprehensive Cancer Center. She also serves on the ACR Board of Directors and is the former chair of the ACR Women in Cancer Research Council. 
Dr. Faishun Yen IJ is the Deputy Division Director of the Division of Oncology 3 in the Office of Oncologic Diseases at the Food and Drug Administration. Mr. Kenneth Frazier is Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer of Markham Company Incorporated. Dr. Levi Garraway is the Chief Medical Officer and Head of Global Product Development of, uh, for Roche and Genentech. Dr. Garraway previously served in the ACR Board of Directors. Dr. Judith Gower is Professor of Oncology at the, and the Medical Director of Native American Program at the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. Dr. Russell Lede is the founding president of 15 White Coats, an advocacy organization of medical students, and is a medical student at Tulane University. Dr. Hannah Valentine is the first chief officer of scientific work, di work diversity and senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health. And last, but definitely not least, Dr. Robert Wynn, the director of the Virginia Commonwealth University Massey Cancer Center and Professor of Pulmonary Disease and Critical Care Medicine. Welcome to all. In 2012, President Barack Obama said, it could be me, in response to the murder of Trevor Martin at the hands of the unconvicted killer, George Zimmerman, who thought the black kid in a hoodie with a bag of candy in his hand should not be walking in his neighborhood. After the murder of George Floyd, Robert Wynn told the cancel letter and Ken Frazier told CNBC it could be me. This strikes very close. I want to start this conversation by asking John and any of the panelists in follow up how the recent events have affected you personally and the steps you're taking to address the issues of racism, racism, inequality, and bias. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, first, I'm, my name is John Carpton. Um, Chair for the University of Southern California Department of Translational Genomics uh, in Los Angeles. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak. Uh, to be honest, I guess over the last two or three weeks has uh, been incredibly emotionally, uh, spiritually, and psychologically draining for me. Um, I've had to talk about this a lot. Um, I think there's, a, you know, of course, a, an important part to that, right, because I do feel a responsibility to my community as a leader, um, but I get asked the question a lot, and um, I, I, I'd, I'd be remiss, you know, if I didn't say that, you know, the events have been, are incredibly disturbing, um, they're incredibly real, um, uh, to, to, to watch that eight minute and 46 second uh, um, uh, uh, tragedy uh, occur uh, in broad daylight with cameras and witnesses and uh, uh, where, you know, a, a white man, you know, could just compress his knee on the neck of a black man for that long while the man screams out for his mother and screams out for his life. Um, and, the, and, and I think that the look on that policeman's face will forever be burned in my brain. Uh, the callousness, the brazenness of his actions um, with no one stepping in to do anything about it um, really woke me up um, uh, and, and, convict, and, and forced me to convict myself that I must not have done enough in my life um, where this type of action could occur um, the way that it occurred. Um, and so I am full of emotion. Um, I am psychologically damaged, I think. Um, I'm working on this myself. Uh, I, I, there have been a lot of events throughout history, um, but this one struck a nerve in me in a way that it's never, it, you know, I've, I've never had the feeling that I felt. Uh, and I'll be honest, it was the moment when I said to myself, no matter what I do, no matter what I accomplish in life, the first thing someone will see in me is black. Um, and, and, and because of the, the stereotypes and stigmatisms that won't have a positive connotation in a lot of lights. Uh, and, and so for a while I walked around with almost a feeling of hopelessness, um, that I could never accomplish enough in life, 
Uh, and uh, I guess over the last couple of weeks through, you know, a lot of prayer and some therapy and some self-reflecting, you know, I'm beginning to, to you know, feel, feel a bit more hope, particularly for my two, my three grandsons. Uh, and my nephews and, and the next generation because of the actions of the people and the actions of the community uh, uh, and the actions of all people um, globally who are seeing this and who are uh, raising their voices uh, uh, against the type of oppression um, uh, that has been and continues to be applied to African Americans in the United States of America. Um, in terms of my own actions, uh, of course, I'm doing a lot to work with as many trainees as I possibly can to uh, ensure that they have the support that they need. Um, you know, here, for instance, at the University of Southern California, we have postdocs who are away from their families, graduate students who are away from their families. Uh, and, and, some, and, and, and in many cases, they're the only African-American trainee in their department, in their lab. Uh, and there can be a sense of isolation, you know, while all of this is occurring. And so I've been doing everything I can to, you know, work with others at the University of Southern California, the Keck School of Medicine, to ensure that our trainees and our, stu and our, and our uh, ESIs and uh, all of our uh, sort of early stage investigators have the support that they need um, as we move forward. Uh, and I guess personally, you know, I, I am definitely a, a much more probably a stronger supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and from my perspective, it's the lives that part that's important to me. Um, I know that uh, a huge component of Black Lives Matter is about uh, police brutality and the killings of Black men, but I also think about the lives part, that Black lives should matter when it comes to, for instance, education. Black lives should matter when it comes to uh, 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 the judicial system and equalities in the judicial system. Black lives should matter when it comes to uh, 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 employment opportunities. And of course, from our standpoint, Black lives should matter when it comes to health equity, right? And so I, am, I, am, I have a renewed purpose and a renewed charge uh, to ensure that that happens. You know, I think it was Mark Twain, who himself might have been a racist, uh, who said uh, the two most important days in a person's life are the day they're born and the day that they find out why. Uh, and that moment in my, in my life has sort of, um, you know, given me a new purpose in life. And I think I know why I was born. And it was to ensure that Black Americans uh, have the freedoms and the rights that are granted to them through the Constitution. So I will continue to fight this fight, and I will fight it at the sacrifice of my own career if I have to, because something has to change. Hey, Tony. Hey, Tony. Um, just, just to piggyback off of what John just said, I think, um, you know, I'll be candid and say that. So my name is Dr. Russell Day, and I'm a third year medical student at Tulane University. Um, and I'll be candid and say that I was chasing after education because I think at, there was a point that I thought I could accomplish enough um, to be valued, like just by society as a whole. That, that, that's me being very honest and true. And I think even my mom and grandmother as a kid told me, you know, as you get more education, the world will treat you better. That's what I was taught. Um, and, and I'll say this as transparent as possible. About nine days ago, um, I woke up at 4 a.m. because my, I, my heart was palpating and I couldn't sleep. And I woke my wife up at 4 a.m. at my computer desk sobbing. I wasn't just crying, like I was uncontrollably sobbing. And it was because I had this reflection moment during one of my dreams where I realized that it is absolutely normal right now for my nine-year-old to turn on the TV and regularly, sometimes monthly or weekly, see a video of someone who looks like her being murdered and it is perfectly legal right now in 2020. Civil rights has passed, the Emancipation Proclamation has passed, Juneteenth has passed, so many things have passed and, and here we are in 2020 and this has happened. And I had to come to the realization that no matter how much education I have, I don't know right now if that education will save it from happening to her or my nephews. I, I don't know if there's a, a gated enough neighborhood to stop that. And that's a numbing feeling because I think sort of like what John was talking about, you almost feel hopeless 
because you're not sure what is going to change it. Um, I gave a speech at a protest a few days ago and someone asked me, um, you know, who's going to save black folks? I said, I don't know who specifically, but I know one thing that will help is a whole bunch of non-black people speaking up and not just being allies. We don't need allies. We need disruptors. We need people who will shake up conversations that they know are racist instead of being complicit at the dinner table. And it starts at the dinner table. I say that because a lot of our psychological thinking, the way we frame the world is built at a dinner table. It is, it's built at a dinner table, it's built by the TV shows you watch, it's built by the conversations in the backyard. The, those, that's where it's built, because those people turn into the CEOs or the police officers or the firefighters or the people on Wall Street making economic decisions for marginalized communities. And, and we, in order for us to eradicate redlining, that's still happening even in 2020 to some degree, people's mindset have to change. That's even in the medical education realm, which I know we'll talk about a little bit later, but in, in every realm, the people who, who are being marginalized can't be the people to solve the problem. It's the people doing the marginalizing that have to solve the problem. And that requires them doing some rethinking and getting rid of some thinking thinking. Thanks, Russell. Um, I want to broaden up the, uh, the conversation a little bit because I, I realize there's a differentiation between overt racism and implicit racial bias and microaggressions that are often experienced by minorities. Uh, these more common uh, um, uh, events uh, affect the progression of black Americans in all aspects of life, including cancer research. So I want to ask uh, Ken and Levi to comment on how organizations like Mark and Roche are engaged in helping address this big problem. Thank you, Dr. Rebus. And let me say how grateful I am to be among this magnificent assemblage of talent and dedicated people uh, to discuss this subject. At Merck, first and foremost, we are committed to conducting research to develop novel medicines and vaccines that address important unmet medical needs to help improve the quality and quantity of life for people all over the world. Recently, we were very pleased, for example, to bring forward a vaccine, a vaccine for Ebola, uh, not an area that people would think would be a money maker for a company like Merck, uh, but because people can't pay for it in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it doesn't make their lives any less worth saving. So the first thing we do is we do that discovery work to try to come forward with new medicines and vaccines. Mm -hmm. We conduct our clinical research in many different countries and include diverse populations, including people of varying age, race, ethnicity, gender, and other characteristics. We also support patient advisory panels, expert input consultations, and other mechanisms to gain insights about what matters to patients and their communities. Community engagement has been especially helpful to increase awareness and education it's really critical to build trust and help people regarding the importance and benefits of clinical trials. You know, when people don't see people like them conducting these trials, uh, they're not so sure whether we're doing something for them or doing something to them. We have to increase opportunities for underrepresented groups to participate in our oncology clinical trials by removing certain barriers, for example, out-of-pocket costs, travel costs, childcare costs, things of that nature. And we are co-sponsoring uh, approaches to provide more equitable access to oncology clinical trials. We have to increase partnerships, and this is extremely important, with minority investigators and those who serve communities of color to help improve the diversity of participants in clinical trials, not just the patients, but the people conducting those trials themselves. I think it's important though to recognize that health disparities and access to cancer research and the promise of that research won't really have an impact until we improve the economic inclusion among people of color, which is the most important root cause of many of the disparities in our society. We're all contending with the COVID-19 pandemic and I think what that has revealed is the stark inequities in our society that have led to a disproportionate impact on people of color. 
So I think it's important for us to broaden our work in our communities, our partnerships with minority owned businesses, for example, ensuring that we are directly working on disparities. For example, we are working on maternal mortality, where in New York City, an African American woman is 10 times more likely to die in childbirth than a white woman. And it doesn't matter what level of education they have to the comments that Russell made a few minutes ago. Lastly, I think we have to come expand the opportunities to train and bring in employees into our company, people of color, because if we are not diverse ourselves, there's no way we can serve um, mankind in its full diversity. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Levi? Yeah, thank you. And I'll add my uh, gratefulness to have the opportunity to be on this panel as well. I want to emphasize one element of the question, Tony, that you raised at the beginning, which or at the before Ken and I started to speak, which was um, making the distinction between the overt racism that, uh, that, for example, the recent weeks, the 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 uh, what, what John described so eloquently uh, and painfully uh, to me personally, uh, around, with what we witnessed with George Floyd and so many others. Yes, there's a distinction between that over, over racism and racial bias, and that's obviously very important. But I think it's equally important to recognize that that same bias is part of a mindset that allows overt racism to fester uh, in our society and to blossom over time, uh, depending on the, the overall environment. And, and that mindset is important because if we don't call it out, then we can't, in where we live, take actions to counter it. And so that mindset uh, that can permeate in our institutions and in our departments and hallways is one that implies that people of color, well, they're maybe they're not quite as legitimate as everyone else. You know, if they, if, it, if they achieve a certain success, well, maybe it's because of a diversity agenda or maybe it's because eh, we lowered our standards a little bit. It's not that that, that success was legitimate uh, in some way. Or if they're not successful, uh, maybe there can be, well, you know, these groups, they just can't cut it, as opposed to maybe there are systemic issues that might have prevented those successes. So I think calling out that mindset and recognizing how prevalent it is, is a big part of countering it. And so, so at, at Genentech and Roche, uh, we have several ongoing efforts to address these. And, and certainly one is a large effort in, in inclusive research, which uh, I think Ken described what's happening at Merck very well. So I won't go into detail because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, alignment and, and harmony of what we're doing there. Uh, but also just in terms of our own culture, we, we recently hired at Genentech a, a chief diversity officer who has a team that represents our entire business uh, and, and, ha and is empowered for uh, a, remit, uh, a remit for action. And, and we did this long before the, the recent events, uh, but certainly the fact that we have this in place has allowed us to really center uh, our focus on, on what progress can look like. And so one clear element there is to develop a plan for all of our officers in our companies in, in our company to, uh, to make progress uh, around diversity and inclusion in their organization. So that's one important area. Another is, is just having race equity training, starting with our leaders, starting actually with the executive committee and, and cascading throughout uh, our, our institution so that the mindset that I just talked about earlier can be recognized. And, uh, and I think one of the comments that was made earlier is when, when people of color aren't in the room, uh, that mindset can then be called out and, and, uh, and countered. Uh, and so, uh, and this is true of Genentech, which is our US uh, element. Our parent company, uh, Roche, has also uh, made similar investments in diversity and inclusion. But maybe I'll just conclude my comments just around a couple of guiding principles. One of which is that this is something where everyone has to own the issue. You can't just have a diversity office and expect these issues to go away. And certainly on our executive committee at Genentech, we've been working very hard uh, to model that principle, particularly now, but, but in general. And then the second point is that if you really want to make a sustained change in this area, one needs to be willing to set goals and measure progress towards those goals and have accountability for those goals. And by the way, goals and quotas are two very different things. Uh, and sometimes these things can be conflated 
uh, and, and that can be used uh, either purposefully or not as blocking in terms of actually making progress. But uh, for everything else we do in life, we set goals and we measure progress uh, to goals. Uh, and this has worked uh, for many institutions in the past, both for gender uh, equality as well as um, minority representation. So uh, th there's a lot more that we need to do at Genentech and Roche, but certainly we're proud of the steps that we've taken thus far. Thank you very much, Levi. A key aspect of the problem of underrepresentation in the cancer workforce is creating and actively recruiting mentors and support for careers of minority investigators. The NIH has been a, a leader in this area and has had a long-standing uh, uh, long-standing problem to address underrepresentation. I want to ask that uh, the first uh, Chief Officer of Scientific Work, uh, Workforce, Hannah, uh, on the NIH perspective, and also want to ask uh, Robert Wynn, uh, the Cancer Center Director himself on the Cancer Center perspective of how can we do a better job at increasing diversity in the workforce, in recruiting uh, and retaining minority faculty and early career scientists. Hannah? Thank you very much. Um, let me first just uh, add my personal comments uh, to the effect of the recent uh, murder of George Floyd. As a person, as a black person, who has lived most of my time in a white society, this came as a bitter reminder, as has already been alluded to, that I am not considered equal. In fact, it made me reflect uh, about uh, a couple of years ago when one of my daughters visited me in my very white Potomac area and expressed concerns that she didn't feel safe because she's an athlete, she runs, she wears a hood, and she would notice that police had slowed down as she walked through our neighborhood. So this was a really bitter reminder. And that's my personal reflection. And it has geared me to do even more. I also have the sense, what more could I have done in the last 15 years where I've been working as a leader in diversity initially at Stanford and then at NIH? It's a, it's a terrible feeling to think that we haven't succeeded despite all these efforts. Now, from the perspective of what NIH is doing, um, I was really touched by the article from the editor of Science, uh, Holden Thorpe, that urged us to look in the mirror. And what that meant to me is that this racism exists everywhere, including science. And in looking in the mirror, I began to reflect on the programs that we have and to the extent that we can be even more successful. And um, one of our roles programs is an attempt to increase black scientists in the path a pathway as well as in a uh, faculty level. And we recognize that it's a vicious circle. If we're not successful in increasing the faculty level uh, diversity in particular black scientists, we will not make a difference. First in the demographics, secondly in the inclusion, and thirdly in the health disparities. So we're working on that um, through the diversity consortium program, the BUILD National Mentoring Network, and even more. But we have actually two specific programs that have recently been launched. One is the Mosaic program, which is uh, an, uh, uh, an abbreviation for maximizing opportunity for scientists and academic to, to independent for independent careers. That is one that brings more um, a, a black uh, a scientists in as, a, as a faculty. And we think that was gonna make a big difference in what we're seeing in the wake of these uh, uh, obvious uh, social injustices that more of the institutes and the institute directors are signing up to do those programs. The second one is called the FIRST program, and that is the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainability. This is something that I've been pushing in the last two years. And what that will do will um, hire a cohort of junior faculty in large areas of research within an institution. So now we're attempting to change the culture within the institution. It will provide funding for the institutions to do that additional work uh, around racism, biases, and mentoring. And we hope that once that's disseminated, we will begin 
to, uh, to really um, do a big difference. And then finally, we have a problem with a gap in the funding rates for African-American black scientists compared to others right throughout the career path. If you look at the training grants, the career development awards, and finally the um, research awards. Now I have some good news, and I think we must have always speak to this issue with some hope. If we continue to speak with a despair that all of us are feeling this week, I don't see how any other of our black trainees will get, join us in this work. So we have some hope. The Career Development Awards, the K Awards, that gap for funding gap for black uh, scientists has been completely eliminated. But the numbers are small. So what we need is to have more people come into the pathway uh, as well. The final elephant in the room is the R01. We are narrowing the gap, but not nearly as much. And what this recent uh, uh, turn of events have done is to get NIH together to look very squarely as to how we, what we need to do to rapidly change that gap. And you will see very shortly some programs come online and some approaches to close this gap immediately, if not sooner. And I'll stop my uh, comments there. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful pa panel, which in a way is a way to support me personally, because this has been a tough, tough three weeks. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you very much, Hannah. I wanna to turn to, to Robert. Uh, I'm sure he has a lot of things to tell us. Uh, Actually, Tony, may I add something? Yeah. May yeah, I please, add? Please, Lola. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I really uh, share and echo uh, all of the previous sentiments that have been um, shared by my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm Lola Pashoina Jay, and um, I'm a medical oncologist and I uh, work at the Food and Drug Administration and I'm here on behalf of the Oncology Center of Excellence. And I thank uh, Tony and, uh, and others at AACR for really putting together this panel because I think it's timely and it's, it's really helping to, to, to think through how to move through uh, some of this. I just wanted to briefly add to Dr. Valentine's comments that you know, intervening early uh, to provide exposure and educational opportunities in science is also really critical. Um, for many communities, you know, models of careers in science are, are quite scarce. And so we, we have recognized this as an important issue. Um, and with our center director's uh, leadership, we've initiated the um, Oncology Center of Excellence Summer uh, Scholars Program four years ago uh, for students around the Washington, D.C., Maryland, uh, area who come from groups that are uh, underrepresented in science and engineering. So uh, black students, Hispanic students, um, women, um, and um, uh, students with uh, disabilities who come to the FDA com campus for uh, a, you know, six week long um, uh, internship where they're really exposed to uh, careers in drug development and the drug development process, as well as you know, career opportunities in government uh, and in science. Um, and we've done this in partnership with um, some uh, pharmaceutical uh, sponsors who are in the area. So I think the issue of the pipeline starts, you know, well before, you know, anyone is eligible for an R01 uh, or a K. It really starts quite early and uh, we can all play a part in, in helping to foster that. So may I just say that I, I truly uh, appreciate that comment and I, and I recognize it. And, and I would add that we've had a lot of pipeline programs. Um, I think we have, a, we have a, what I often call as a proximal coronary stenosis in that there's a blockage in the pipeline. And until we unblock that pipeline in the transition to faculty, I think we will limit the capability of even expanding the, the pipeline earlier that you're alluding to. Yes, it's not a, a zero sum game. We don't have to be, think about it in that way. But one area that has been entirely forgotten uh, and really not a lot of NIH investment is in the faculty. We've got to do that. I tell you, if we don't, it will be a very slow path to change. I think it's a great, great transition to, to Robert. And thank you very much, Lola, for this comment and Hannah.
Robert, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, so thank you very much. I mean, I really, uh, one, I'm happy to be part of this panel. I do think that uh, the time now of getting together um, and having a voice and a unified voice is probably more critical than it's ever been. Um, that it has taken a viral pandemic and a chronic racial sort of endemic um, to intersect for us to wake up out of our national delirium, state of delirium, um, to be quite honest with you, if it took all that for us to get here, then that's what it took. The reality is many of us have been saying the same thing for God knows since, you know, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. And we almost, it's, it's, it's like a fugue state. We keep going back to the same information. Someone said, well, how do we improve um, pipeline programs and how do we get more people? And I said, hmm, that's interesting. So let me liken it to a diet. We all know that losing weight and being at an ideal weight is a good thing for us, makes us healthy. And in fact, I would, I would even challenge you that you probably right now could go through drawerfuls of proven diet plans to lose weight. So the issue isn't that we don't know that it's good for us and nor that it is we have a way. We've been prescribing these ways in racial terms of equity since 1965 and then subsequently every decade after that. So this excuse that we need to restudy, we need to replan, what I suggest is we just need to do. And to have the will is the hardest part of this whole issue. Now, I became a, before I became a cancer center director here at VCU Massey, which I am proud to be, um, you know, again, head of an NCI designated cancer center, I, I had a former life as a admissions dean. And I'll share with you just this really short story. I was at University of Colorado at the emissions problem there, they would say, well, you know, it's almost impossible to get minorities here. We're a top university and it's just impossible to get minorities here. And I said, well, okay. They said, you know, in one case, we've spent X number of million dollars. And in fact, at our best, we only got 8%. Let me tell you a fact. When I ended my tenure as admissions dean for the University of Colorado, they had 42% underrepresented minorities in their class. The fact of the matter is it did not bring down the GPA, nor did it actually reduce the MCAT. In fact, what I do know is that the truth of the matter is that when you want to get something done, you get it done. Now, people ask me, well, how did you go from and do that? The truth of the matter is instead of waiting for people to come to me, the typical way in which we do right now, we call searching. If it falls in my lap, then that's great. But I reminded someone, if I was the basketball coach or the football coach at University of Colorado at that time, my actual uh, merit and my rank and my worth would be on my ability to recruit. So what did I do? I actually recruited. As a former athlete, I recruited. Everywhere I went, I recruited. When I heard about top talent, I recruited. The truth of the matter is people keep talking about the pools aren't there. The pools aren't there. The pools are there, but the reality is you have to know about them and then get over your inertia to humble yourselves to actually go to those pools in which you get the best players or the best academics or the best researchers. The truth of the matter is I refute that we don't know how to get this done. And in fact, I would even point to Dr. Sonia Springfield and Dr. Valentine that they already have programs and that we've had programs that have been validated, some of them 20 years ago. It's not the issue that we don't know, it's the issue of the will. And just like any chronic disease, the reality is we know what the disease is. We know what it happens when we don't treat it. The truth of the matter is when you know what the, what the treatment is, you still have to stay committed. And at some point, I think during this issue around equity, we felt that just like an antibiotic that was prescribed for 14 days, when we took it for eight days, we probably, or four days, we probably felt good, so we stopped. So part of this was a national state of delirium that caused us to take our eye off the prize and stopped us from doing the practices that we know we needed to do every day. So hopefully from this point forward, we are more than just woke, we are active about maintaining our health 
not only just our personal health, but this racial equity, putting that all together, our health on a daily basis. That's my wish. Hey, and Tony, so I'll stop there. Please. Tony, Tony, can I, I just quickly add, oh, I'm sorry. Now go ahead. Go ahead, John. No, I was just going to add that, you know, uh, Dr. Wynn, I agree. You know, I, I also think that, you know, besides the will, you know, it's almost like alcoholism where, you know, racism, people have to admit that they are racist. And I think that that's the biggest problem we're facing here. There are a lot of people who are, are active racists, um, don't really know that they're racist, um, in, engage in racist activities on, on a daily basis, but can't admit it. And it's just like an alcoholic. And so I, I liken it to alcoholism more so than an infectious disease, where we've got a huge majority of, the, of this country, right? Who, who practice racism on a daily basis, practice discrimination, but they do not admit that they're racist. They cannot own that. They cannot say that I am a racist. <laughs> they, it, it's, it's hard uh, for some reason. I, I don't know what that reason is because I'm not one of them, but it's hard for them to accept that. But it's like an alcoholic. A lot, there are a lot of people in society who are in positions of power who have to accept that and admit that openly, right? before they can begin to work on the problem. Yes. It's like an alcoholic. And you know, um, Let me real just quick. Add, I, do think that, I do think that that is absolutely correct. But I think the, the next step is equally important in doing something. And in that recognition is that the structures, the institutional structures need to be attended to, to turned down, uh, to, uh, uh, re uh, removed and, and uh, replaced. And then for those who are working and doing, doing this work, tie it to reward systems, right? What's measured gets done and what gets rewarded gets done. And so I would move very quickly from the I am an alcoholic to let's fix it. And it's fixing it it's beyond the individual, it's the systems. You know, Tony, I, I, I wanted to add to, 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 uh, to Dr. Wynn's comment. Um, as a proud graduate of a historically black college and university, I always find it um, ironic that people are like, I, I can't find any diverse talent in terms of, in terms of specifically um, black students, right? So there are like tons of HBCUs around this country. Um, and I always used to wonder, like, why don't you visit these institutions? And I kind of liken it to, um, I've had these moments where I was riding in my car with one of my non-Black friends, and we turn into certain neighborhoods, right? And they make sure the doors are locked, or that their seatbelt is on, or they're attentive to everything. But then we turn into other neighborhoods, and they don't even know what's going on. And I kind of think of it like that because I always wonder why don't people visit HBCUs? And my notion, I think my thought process is, is that they think of it as a really poor rundown neighborhood that they don't want to visit because they're not familiar with it. And the reason why they are liking it to that is because the people who are there, they have that thought, that same thought process about those people. So even though the buildings can be pristine, I mean, you, you could go, you could walk around you know, uh, North Carolina a and you could walk around Southern University, you could walk around Grambling. These, the, the buildings are beautiful, just as, build, you know, just as beautiful as they are at Louisiana State University or Harvard or anywhere else, right? Or even at UPR, you can, you can go there and visit and it's beautiful. But if you, don't, if you don't equate that the people are beautiful, that they're valuable, that their minds are brilliant, then you, I mean, you can make the argument like, oh, it's in a, you know, it's in a very remote place. It takes too much time. It takes too much resources. That's just fundamentally not true. Like Dr. Wynn said, we, when you want to get something done, you'll get it done. And when you don't, you'll find every excuse in, like on the planet to say why it can't be done. The reality of the situation is there, there are a ton of brilliant, beautiful minded students who have melanin in their skin walking around these campuses who are the next faculty. They should be the next faculty. But kind of like Dr. Valentine was saying, you also got this coordinator issue going on where 
even if you were to get them into graduate school and get them through a postdoc. They can't get a faculty position. So I think they also say to themselves, there's no point in me recruiting those students because I know I won't hire them later on anyway. And I'll only get the ones that will give me the reward I want. And that's it. I'll only go as far as the reward will make me go. And that's about as far as I'll go. But I think that requires some internal changing that we value these people um, as much as the people who look like me. And I say we, because I know that these people who are in power are generally cis white males. Let's just get that out the way. Um, and they have to start to value people who don't look like them you know, and don't behave like them the same way they value themselves and the people who look like them. I'd actually add quickly that um, we need to become a society of and as opposed to or. We've lived too long with the or. Um, and I think as leaders of cancer centers and leaders just all over at our universities, directors and division heads, we need to become a culture of and period. And to go back to John, I, you know, the, the funny part about being an alcoholic, I, I thought about this was that the, you know, you know, Amy Cooper is, you know, you know, two things have happened that I think have changed the, the, the way in our trajectory. And as that we can no longer deny it because we see it in its full entirety. George Floyd, you know, we've seen bits and pardons of Trayvon or we've heard about things. We've, you know, done certain things, but we've only seen bits and parts. We saw the whole thing. Amy Cooper, ultimately a person that we know is a graduate from an outstanding top five university, was a supporter of Obama, true. Was a, is a supporter of Biden, true. Gave money, did more than just vote for them, they supported them. And yet there's still the blind spot that when someone by the name of Christian Cooper, yes, African-American male, just simply said, you should put your dog on a leash in the park, all of a sudden was saying, don't tell me what to do. I'll call the police on you, knowing full well as an African-American what happens when the police get called. In fact, I have personal experience with that. So to be quite honest with you, when it comes to all of our leaders, we have to think full blown about the goalposts we have right now, George Floyd and the Amy Coopers. And for many of our leaders of our institutions, we really have to be sensitive to don't become the, you know, see the Amy Cooper that lives inside of everyone, but certainly see the Amy Cooper that lives inside of you. Call that out, and I think we'll be able to actually start moving things. Thanks for this discussion. I, I, this is really inspirational. I, I, I want to say one thing from Russell's remarks. Russell created 15 white coats to address um, uh, the, the, the problems of not having enough racism discussed in graduate training and medical school and has been advocating for this and all of the efforts that are being done from the NIH, the FDA and the cancer centers. But I want to turn the conversation to something that Ken brought via, uh, in his remarks, which is about healthcare inequalities in minority population. This panel has some of the world leaders uh, in this field. Uh, I, recently, I was I just saw the, the embargoed version of the ACR Cancer Disparities Progress Report 2020, which is a book with striking statistics on the differences of cancer incidence, access to care, participation in clinical trials, and outcomes in minority populations and patients. John is the chair of the, uh, the steering committee of this, uh, of this uh, report, and Marsha and Robert are members of the committee and have contributed, and many of you have uh, brought ideas that have helped uh, uh, in this, uh, in, in this uh, report. It's going to be released in September. I'm sure it's going to be uh, um, I, 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 uh, a very important document that will be shared widely. So I want to get Julie and Marsha on, on, on the conversation because the racial and cultural biases have been pervasive also with Hispanics, Latinos, and indigenous populations. Um, as Ken has as said before, the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we're seeing this, uh, that the more vulnerable are, being, are suffering a lot more and, uh, and, uh, and the severity of the disease and, and the incidence is worse in minority populations. Um, in fact, after this panel discussion, we have uh, a Minorities in Cancer Research, a special symposium on health inequalities and disparities during the COVID-19 pandemic. We thought it was important to have a whole session in the annual meeting uh, just dedicated to this because it's affecting so importantly. But uh, I want to ask Marsha and Judith uh, uh, to talk about the measures that you think should be taken in to address the healthcare inequalities in populations, especially during this pandemic. Marsha? Yes, um, thank you, Tony. And again, just like everyone else stated, I'm honored to be part of this team. And this 
helped us to not only discuss what is, is on our mind, but also to reflect and think strategically in you know, what can be done. Uh, I think this party is, as a field has evolved dramatically. And during the last years, we've all been working together. In fact, thank you for making a note about the uh, you know, the annual report that John Carpton um, really helped us lead, um, lead the way. COVID has actually showed us again that the same inequalities that are pervasive, that have perpetuated, you know, increases in not only worse outcomes about minorities, including, you know, Latinos and also African Americans and other groups, but those same groups are the ones that have been disproportionately affected by COVID. And just to look at the data, right, we know that from 13% of the Americans that are African Americans, 33% or almost 36%, depending on, on the data, have been the ones that were affected by COVID. And then when you look at uh, the morbidity and the mortality associated by, you know, to COVID, when you look at how many people died when they were, you know, infected by COVID, so you, you, we, we saw that the, uh, the death rate among minorities, both Latinos and African Americans, was two to three times higher when compared to non, you know, non-Hispanic um, whites. So, you know, the questions there are a myriad, right? Uh, we do know that there are certain risk factors, including comorbidities, that are more common among, you know, minorities, including Latino communities. Access to testing. Uh, there, there are a hundred different things that we can think of, but you really poise the question up about, you know, what can we do? What can we do, you know, what can we do immediately? And I think one of the aspects that we cannot forget is that there are hospitals that take care of minority groups. Uh, they are disproportionately carrying the burden of this disease. So providing resources to those hospitals that take care of the patients is key. The other aspect that really resonates with me, it's the number of minority uh, Latinos and African Americans that work at first or essential workers. They are delivery people. They are, you know, uh, officers that are first, first responders, yet they have worse outcomes associated to that. So because of the epidemic, we also have seen that there's a significant amount of layoff. And who do they disproportionately affect? Once again, the racial and ethnic minorities. So one you know, aspect that should we really happen very quickly is to provide Medicaid coverage for all those group of individuals that are, you know, immediately lost opportunities because they lost their job. Uh, and those are two immediate things that we can think of. If you think more prospectively, more into the future, uh, we cannot forget that as, you know, the COVID pandemic starts to ease out, we need to go back to cancer prevention, early detection, you know, minorities are by far uh, the, the groups that present with cancer at advanced stage. And it's usually a direct response of simply not having the right test at the right time. So we cannot forget that once this is moving forward, we need to go back to cancer screening, cancer prevention. So, it, you know, the, just to say a few things. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Marcia. So I, I definitely uh, have been attentive to all of these comments. And I too bring a historical perspective. I may be the elder on this panel, I'm not telling my age, but uh, I, uh, I grew up uh, as a Choctaw Cherokee woman from Oklahoma and grew up uh, ultimately in Chicago uh, and was recruited late in life after, uh, after being a science teacher for another number of years and a, a stay-at-home mom I ultimately uh, went to the Indians into Medicine program at the University of North Dakota. And Dr. Wynn, uh, I was successful at transferring to the University of Colorado, which introduced me to cancer, and that became my passion. So my career has been spent working with uh, indigenous peoples around the world, uh, and in this country, particularly American Indians and Alaska Natives, uh, over all of the commonalities of chronic disease. Health disparities has a lot of common roots. And so we need to acknowledge that. Uh, and I grew up as the first in my family to graduate from high school. My parents didn't have the opportunity of education. And so as other, other panel members said, I still am a strong believer that education and pipelines are extremely important to what AACR has to uh, really support. 
I grew up in an age when my family uh, traveling through the South could not go into whites only establishments. I knew everything about the civil rights movement and lived it and worked in it and was dismayed when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. I saw the riots in Chicago in 1968 and these last couple of weeks brought back a lot of those memories as well. So it's painful again to acknowledge the overt, ugly, dangerous aspects of racism uh, while also, as we all know, acknowledging that the undercurrent of racism has made it very difficult for our brightest and best to even think about going into cancer research, health disparities research. But we must, we must continue to try to focus on understanding the science of health disparities and the science of, of healthcare uh, delivery. Uh, there is nothing that will improve unless we really focus on a lot of those things. At my home institution, these last few weeks, we've really been focusing on what we call everybody in conversations to try to address these uh, unspoken fears, racism, concerns, attitudes uh, within ourselves. And so we've been having some very meaningful conversations um, and recognizing that it's not always uh, black or white. Um, one of my hematology fellows came to me recently and was disturbed by a patient who was very offensive to one of our female Muslim fellows. And so we, we involved uh, the leadership, we involved the attending physicians, we stand firmly on what we tell patients that that is not allowed, that if they abuse a team member, then the team can choose not to, to continue care for a patient who, who violates those basic values that we all hold necessary. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, obviously, the, uh, the problems with the African-American community are front and foremost right now. And it's very ironic that last year, I attended AACR in Atlanta, and now we see this year where everything is heading. So we need all of us to pitch in. We need, yes, we need allies, but we also need re-education and recommitment to the values that AACR stands for. Tony. Thank you, Judith. Um, I, this, uh, this panel was started by an idea from Rick Pasteur from the FDA and John Retzlaff at ACR. I think it's, it, it's been a great idea. And I want to go back to Lola to talk about the FDA because you've been really proactive about the problems with healthcare inequalities, but also the represent underrepresentation of minorities in clinical trials. So I wanted to, uh, to ask you what the FDA has been uh, doing about, about this issue. Sure, um, thank you for the question and uh, thank you for agreeing to uh, host this panel. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, Dr. Wynn and others have, um, have been very, have articulated uh, quite well um, the fact that we know that these problems exist and these problems have existed long before, you know, Mr. Floyd, um, you know, was murdered. Um, and so, you know, we also know that there are solutions that work. We know that there are places in this country that do a very good job at enrolling uh, diverse uh, patient populations in clinical trials. You know, the fact of the matter is that over the last several, you know, years, decades, um, we are seeing a decrease in the proportion of U.S. patients who are enrolled in clinical trials. Um, and what that does is that the patients who ultimately are supporting approval of new therapeutics for oncology, for example, are not really reflective of the diversity of the U.S. population. Um, and that, has, that is problematic on many levels, including the fact that um, you know, there's decreased access, there's no access to a majority of patients to be on clinical trials, which in many diseases is still the best care that can be received uh, for the patient. Um, the other issue is that for diseases where we know that there are differences that are race and ethnicity based, 
albeit it may be, you know, a proxy for something else, but diseases like multiple myeloma, where we see that outcomes are different, uh, it's problematic that, you know, we are having to approve drugs that um, are not really uh, appropriately characterizing safety effectiveness uh, in those demographic subgroups. Um, so, you know, we've done a, a lot of work in uh, ensuring that there's a lot of transparency around this issue, uh, because again, as we're learning from the events of the recent weeks, even though these issues are well described and have been well uh, discussed, uh, thoroughly discussed over several, several years, um, there, there's not the response that is appropriate uh, to this issue. Um, in regards to what we're doing, you know, we've been engaging with a lot of partners, AACR included, ASCO and others, to um, broaden eligibility criteria in clinical trials, which is a, an often really um, uh, problematic uh, barrier uh, for a lot of uh, underrepresented minorities uh, in clinical trials, um, such that, you know, patients really need to be sort of the marathon runner who happens to have cancer and not necessarily the patient who will be receiving the drug post-approval. Um, so we've been discussing and working uh, with AACR most recently on uh, strategies to uh, in increase enrollment in multiple myeloma trials. Um, and, and we've been doing this for eligibility criteria across the board. We are promoting and encouraging sponsors to really adopt clinical trial designs that allow for broader and more inclusive enrollment in trials, even if the um, analysis of efficacy and safety that will support the approval are based on a more restricted patient population, because that will give, you know, not only broader access to a trial, but it will also uh, enable us to collect information in the most sort of standardized um, and um, controlled fashion for patients who may have more comorbidities. Um, because there are many experiments happening in the medical oncologist's offices every day as they try to figure out how to use a drug that was approved for the marathon runner uh, on the patient who's sitting uh, right before them. So um, we're hoping that this will um, address some of the issue. But I think a lot of what we've heard has to do with, you know, knowing that there's a problem and knowing what works but not adopting that necessarily. I think another issue is that there's there's globalization of clinical trials, and that seems that's that's what is a fact of of life uh, currently. Their speed of drug development is making such that you know trials are being conducted uh, mostly in willing patients outside of the United States. But we are also seeing that there's disparities in how those ex US sites are being selected. They're not you know clinical trial sites are not enrolling patients in sub-Saharan Africa a place where trials can be conducted, and many of our HIV drugs were developed within trials that were conducted in that site. That has not sort of worn out in the oncology space. Um, so, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Central America are places that, you know, uh, could also be explored as potential ways to enroll patients with ancestry that's similar to patients who are underrepresented in U.S. trials. Um, I think the other issue, which I was glad to hear um, Mr. Frazier and, um, and uh, Dr. Carol Garraway uh, talk about uh, earlier, is the issue of accountability. Um, so, you know, about three or four years ago, I piloted a project where I was requesting from sponsors that they provide a plan, a specific plan, for enrolling racial and ethnic minorities in the clinical trials particularly in diseases where we know that African Americans and other minorities are overly represented among cases of the disease. And to be quite frank, the response was disappointing. Uh, we got very general plans that were not specific, that did not identify targets and how to achieve those targets. And I think if we're going to really make a difference and we're really going to put action to the commitments that we're making, that that needs to change. We need to take bold action in being accountable uh, for addressing uh, this really dire issue. Uh, we have mobilized quite well during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you know, and industry partners, government have mobilized to really expedite in, you know, and, and collaborate on, um, you know, addressing the issues of the COVID pandemic. And my hope really is that that same vigor and expediency 
will be applied to this issue because it, it's not unlike, this is a problem. This is a very big problem. Um, you know, we often get asked the question, well, why do you approve these drugs if they are not enrolling the requisite diverse patient population? So I want to address that issue um, because I think that while big companies like Merck or Genentech um, will lose, you know, some financial gain from not approving a drug, you know, the biggest losers are the patients. So we are not in the business. Patients don't have the luxury of time. We are not in the business of not approving drugs that work. I think we do need to be in the business of ensuring that the drugs we approve are working for a majority of patients. And that's why I, would, I am very encouraged by what I'm hearing from Mr. Frazier and Dr. Garraway, and I hope others who are listening, um, that we really need to take bold action. We know what works, we know there's a problem, and we need to fix it. Um, so I'll stop here because I know we're running on time. Uh, thanks, Lola. I think it would be great to hear from uh, Ken and Levi uh, in response to these. Well, I'll simply say that I can only wholeheartedly agree with those comments. As I said earlier, we think it's critical at Merck for us to increase opportunities both for underrepresented patients and patient groups to participate in the oncology clinical trials by removing barriers. And I didn't get into any detail, but there are a number of programs that we have where we're trying to establish platforms for more equitable access to those trials. But also we need to increase partnerships importantly with the minority investigators who treat many of these patients. Uh, too often we go to the usual suspects, the, the academic medical centers that, um, that we've, we're very used to using. Uh, and if we don't branch out similar to the conversation we had about historically black colleges and universities, we won't pick up enough of those patients. So I wholeheartedly agree with everything that Lola said. And, we're gonna be working with the FDA and others to make sure this is not just something that has enormous rhetorical appeal, but happens in reality. Yeah, I, I fully agree with Ken. And actually, as I was listening to Lola, I was thinking back to my time in academia when uh, there were instances where we were designing studies and precision oncology or what have you, and uh, when it came time to thinking about how are we going to test the hypothesis or, or be inclusive uh, for minority populations or underrepresented populations, I know for myself, and I think many of my colleagues who are who were at the top research institutions, if you tried to do that within your own institution, it was going to be hard. I mean, and when you actually started running the numbers, it was actually eye-opening how segregated the care is uh, in at places that are trailblazing the clinical trial research and the basic research. It was, it was, it was sobering. So uh, what that means is that, th that, that, now that you talk about uh, practical uh, areas for opportunity in cancer research, that's one. And it's an issue of will. It's an issue to say, hey, how can we partner, uh, not just so that we can do inclusive research, but because it's just the right thing to do, you know, for our populations that are right uh, at our front doorstep who we don't care for, what can we do to be better? Uh, and, and if we do that, it will lift all boats. And as, as Ken said, very much uh, we see the same issues that, that there can be, you know, you, you, you run metrics and analytics and these are the sites that do a good job in rolling and that there can be this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that you go back to the same sites. But those are the sites that tend to, um, that tend to be associated with, with uh, underrepresentation. So that requires a conscious investment to cultivate sites that have broader populations so that we can in fact ask the questions about, well, is, is the biology of the disease the same in different populations? The, this is, everybody wins if we have the opportunity to ask these questions, regardless of what the answer is. Because as, as Lola said, this is about doing what's right for patients. And we can't do that if we're not able to, uh, to be inclusive in the way that we ask our clinical questions and include populations uh, from many regions. Actually, and this this is not just a underrepresented minority issue. This is rural America and, and global populations. It's equally important there. So I can see the reactions of all of you. Yeah. Uh, go, uh, go ahead right. to the uh, quick and then we'll uh, go ahead. So I just so wanted to add a little to um, Lola's very poignant uh, uh, remarks. Thank you for that. Um, just with the respect to the COVID-19, uh, NIH has launched the rapid 
acceleration of diagnostics program. And a component of that, actually a large component of that, is RADEX UP. And that is entirely for underserved populations. And this way, at least from the diagnostics part, it will be focused on the underserved populations, African-American, Black, Hispanic, et cetera. And so we're very excited to see what kinds of applications come in for that. Thanks, Carmen. So, so this is Dr. Judith. Francis Collins is going to be talking about this during the annual meeting, so it's, oh, it's very okay. important. Uh, Judith, well, uh, yeah. could you please give our uh, last comments on this and then we'll wrap up going around. Sure, sure. So uh, I'm often reminded of uh, the quote from Willie Sutton, why did he rob banks? Because that's where the money was. We have to do that with our uh, minority uh, institutions and our clinics that are right there in the community because access to care is what keeps people from enrolling in clinical trials. Um, I am very interested in what's happening with telehealth during COVID. It is really accepted very well by patients. I think if we could reduce the costly trips into the major medical centers by patients and their family members who have to take off from work, um, that in itself could be a boon. I think we may learn whole new ways of, of efficiently and effectively including patients and families in our trials if we maximize that. Thank you, Judith. And it's obvious that from the reactions, all of you would want to, I uh, would have a lot more comments and we could continue talking a long time. And I think this panel is opening the conversation in many ways and it has to be continued that that's the, the reason for having this panel. But I would like to take the last minutes to go around the room and uh, ask each one of you to tell us what are your calls to action? What are the main points that you want to drive uh, from, from, here, from here? And I'm going to follow our alphabetically uh, because just there's a, no easy way to do this. So uh, we'll start with John and then go down. John? Yeah, I'll try to be brief because I know we have a, a, lot, of, a, a lot of individuals um, who have some amazing things to say. Uh, I, I think first and foremost, I you know, want to say that there has been progress, right? Um, I, I think it's important to say that. Um, I think it's important to say, you know, this is an AACR session. You know, AACR has been among the leaders in really trying to push, uh, particularly in, in the area of cancer research, um, you know, to, uh, you know, bring minority scientists to the table. Um, you know, great example of that is the minorities in cancer research. Um, component of, of, of AACR and uh, the MICR Council um, who are charged with, you know, trying to provide uh, support and guidance uh, and uh, to provide a, you know, a fertile infrastructure uh, for, for and support for minority scientists in, in the organization uh, and to help promote cancer disparities research. That's not the specific mission, but these are some of the activities that MICR uh, plays a significant role in. And, um, uh, that one of the things that burst out of that was the Science for Cancer Health Disparities Conference, uh, which was developed, I think, back in two, 2006, 2007, uh, which is an annual special conference of AACR uh, that brings many of the thought leaders in the area of cancer disparities together, many of whom are underrepresented minority scientists, um, to talk about the state of the art uh, in cancer disparities research uh, and things that we can do to uh, move more towards uh, cancer uh, health, health equity. I'd also uh, want to uh, remind, uh, again, uh, it's been mentioned before, the uh, NCI Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities under the leadership of Sonia Springfield uh, and before her, Paulette Gray and uh, Harold Freeman, uh, who now have an RFA out, right, to really help understand the uh, 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 biology uh, related, uh, the biological components of cancer disparities. Uh, they also have the, the PATCHI, the Partnerships to Advance Cancer Health Equity, uh, a network um, uh, which uh, brings together a compre NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center with a minority serving institution to help build infrastructure at that minority uh, serving institution uh, and to help grow their faculty and their students. Um, uh, towards, uh, you know, careers in, in biomedical research, particularly cancer research. So, so progress has been made, uh, undoubtedly, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, and again, I, I really think that we have to get to a point where people can begin to feel comfortable 
uh, um, uh, recognizing racism. And yes, racism is a hard word. We want tend, tend to want to use this word diversity and inclusion because it sounds better. I think it, people are more comfortable with that. But we've, we've got to become more uncomfortable if we're really going to move the needle uh, uh, and, and see racism dispelled in America. Um, I think you know some of the things that the NIH should do and continue to do, for instance, is to look at study sections. Um, uh, a, a, a lot of the funding problems occur right at the, at the study section level when those reviews are being performed, when you look at the names of the investigators, when you look at the track record of the investigators, when you look at the institutions where those investigators come from, and then begin to uh, uh, use implicit bias to make judgments on that science uh, before you even get to the science. We know this is real. It's been documented. We know it's real. And I think that that needs to continue to be explored and those processes and approaches need to be uh, modified and changed. Uh, so that we can see more diversity on study sections uh, and, and minority scientists can feel more comfortable that their grants are going to be uh, uh, judged based on the content of the science and not the, the, the race of the, of the applicants. I also agree that we need to do more work with our historically black colleges and universities. Uh, we need to take larger, more bold approaches we need to put more resources into those minority serving institutions so we can continue to grow the cadre of, of, of scientists. I myself am a, a product of a historically black college at Lane College where I did my undergraduate work. Uh, and so to continue to promote uh, uh, engagement and relationships uh, between major institutions and these historically black colleges and to help build significant infrastructure there so that we can uh, continue to build up the um, the, the pipeline of trainees towards careers in cancer research. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, John. Marsha? Thank you. Uh, echo John's comments. I just want to emphasize three aspirational goals. Education is still key. It is true that it's not perfect. It is true that despite education, there's still many biases and many barriers that we need to you know, remove, but education is key. We need to improve access to education so that we can move people. We can allow people to be at the same level. However, if there's no representation of minorities, of racial minorities, of ethnic minorities, at the C-suite, we're missing out. I've heard before that if you're on the table, you're on the menu, but I think that it's even worse than that. I think that if, if we, if big companies, you know, um, the government agencies, peer review panels, uh, private industry, pharma, if the members of those organizations, those members that are the leaders, do not look like us, do not uh, have us in, our, in their minds, then when programs are being set up, uh, when, um, aspects that are important for minorities and you know, not only um, racial and ethnic minorities, but other types of minorities, then we miss out. I think we need to change the uh, focus and let health equity be the rule, not the exception. Right now, we're starting from, a, from an unbalanced um, scenario, but I think we can change. I think we can make things happen. So policies, education, representation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcia. Lola? Yeah, sorry, I uh, had to unmute myself. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I will be brief. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's quite fortuitous uh, and fitting that uh, Ken and, and Levi are uh, giving their closing remarks after me. So I'm going to use my time to um, extend an invitation, uh, a challenge really, to um, my fellow panelists uh, in leadership roles in pharma, um, so Ken, Levi, and others who are watching to commit to developing and implementing an action plan um, to achieve more diverse racial and ethnic representation in clinical trials over the next one, five years. And I emphasize the action part of this because I think we need to see results. I think we have studied the issue extensively, um, uh, and I think we need, just need to take bold action um, in order to really... Um, you know, put some weight behind a commitment to providing equitable access to clinical trials and generating data on uh, racial and ethnic minorities. I think this is really what's going to improve health outcomes for patients. And our patients deserve this, and they deserve much more than this. And, and so I'm really hoping that, you know, um, you know, Ken and Levi and other industry leadership and representatives who are listening to this session uh, will take me up, will take FDA up on this offer so that by next year's annual meeting, we can report back on the bold and 
um, and really impactful um, strides that we've made in uh, towards achieving this goal. So I'll stop there. Thank you. That's a great challenge for us to follow on. I'm talking about C-suite, Ken. Thank you. I appreciate being part of this panel and Lola, I will take you up on the challenge because it's critical. I think it comes down to a question of prioritizing this versus the millions of other things that we have to do in order to be successful. I think if we're going to elim eliminate racism and racial disparities, we have to acknowledge them to the alcoholism comment, but we also have to prioritize action. And I would say the other thing I would say at the end of the day is that a lot of the structural elements of racism are not just in the medical field. Uh, I will say economic inclusion is a critical issue for African Americans all throughout the country. As leaders, of, as scientists, as researchers, as academics, as business people, we need to prioritize economic inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And another suite, the C-suite, Levi. Well, I, I too have been, uh, have deeply appreciated this panel. Lola, we're right there with you uh, on the challenge. And I guess I'd like to direct my closing comments as a uh, erstwhile cancer researcher and still a member of the AACR community uh, to address the question. So one thing that gives me hope, and I fully hear uh, the, the pain that was expressed earlier in this call about, uh, you know, it can feel like is there is there is there hope for uh, people like me and, and my kids and that kind of thing. Um, but I am hopeful right now because uh, I have seen uh, a, a response to this issue in recent weeks of a magnitude that I've never seen before, including from many dear colleagues uh, who are um, cancer researchers who are not in members of underrepresented minorities. And so I want to address my comments to them because often they are asking, you know, what can I do uh, in, in my space to help here? And, um, you know, for me, there are, there are three things that I think about. The, the first is uh, to be a mentor. When I think about my, my career mentors, uh, most of them, at least at this point in time, you know, might be described as older white guys. But let me tell you, they have hearts of gold. And I would not be where I am if it was not for them. So there are, uh, there are so many wonderful people out there who can reach out to someone perhaps who doesn't look like them or come from their background uh, and be a mentor uh, and, and unleash that talent that uh, Russell was talking about earlier. The second is to call out examples of the mindset when you see them, especially when there are no people of color around. Uh, we, we need that kind of, uh, of partnership. And the third that I would say is, um, and this gets to the, the deeper systemic issues, which is to be a true friend to colleagues of color. And by being a true friend, it doesn't just mean having lunch from time to time. It means inviting them and their families into your circles. Uh, because often where the networking and success and opportunities happen are in those unspoken networks, you know, the professional clubs or religious congregations or uh, other social clubs. And, and those often are segregated across the United States. So when I think about in practice, like what are concrete tactical things that people can do, it's those kinds of things uh, that will counter the underlying mindset, uh, in addition to the important structural considerations that have been discussed during this call. Thank you very much, Levi. Judy? So I think of all the years that we have spent writing articles about barriers. Enough of that. Uh, we know what those barriers are. Let's pick barriers and pick strategies and goals and tasks that will get us over those barriers. And I, I agree with Levi. Challenge your colleagues to say, when they say, what can I do? Have a list of, yeah, you can sponsor a student to the next AACR meeting you can mentor someone in your lab. You can be more uh, open uh, to ideas that are not necessarily exactly uh, mainstream. And um, I, I also say, I will look in the mirror and say, what else can I be doing? You know, John said it well, uh, this last couple of weeks, we say, gosh, I've spent 45 years in medicine. Why are we still talking about healthcare disparities? I will look in the mirror and I will find ways that I pick a couple of things that I personally can do. 
Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, we'll go to Hannah. Yes, thank you. I, I will just say that I resonated so much with the, the comments that have been made, particularly the um, admonition from John to what NIH can be doing, and we are doing those things. And you will be hearing, for example, about a study around um, the biases, potential biases and peer review and what we'll be doing about it. But I would say that um, we've reached the stage of um, paralysis by analysis and we must move to the next stage. And uh, I am pushing really hard for that at all of those levels that we already know needed to be intervened upon, the transition to faculty, uh, the equity in grant funding, and more, and the real dissemination of the uh, federal resources to across uh, the board uh, in, a, in a more equitable manner. But I just wanted to end by sharing some very useful reflections that our advisory committee to the director provided us with um, the working group on diversity because they pointed to the fact that although we talk about diversity, there is a unique and important aspect that's to do with being black in this country and this science. And we must recognize it and openly talk about it because it is part of our history. And if we don't, we will not lead to, uh, to solutions. And in this light, we must also be promoting community-based research, uh, very important, and that's the route towards uh, so a lot of the solutions. The third thing they talked about was that at this time, we must be supporting our Black peers. Chances are most of us are suffering and the emotional support will go a long way. Fourthly, we really have to keep committees that are the gatekeepers. We have to keep them accountable for the kinds of res uh, 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 evaluations that they're making. And uh, NIH has huge levers and that we must begin to use these levers, even in the face of the legal constraints that bind us from acting and using the levers connected fully. And then finally, this has really come home to me. Many of my colleagues across the country in the epidemic of sexual harassment called me and said, Hannah, what are you doing? Why are you all over this when we have this other problem that has been there for years, which is the racism against black people? And to that, the committee advised us that these episodes at the very least must be monitored tracked and punished in the, with the same expediency as we've been talking about for sexual harassment over the last two years. And I am deeply committed to that level of change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. It seems like I cannot keep straight, I keep the alphabet straight. And uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, Russell, I skip you <laughs> going down the list. So go, let's go back to Russell. You're on mute, Russell. Yeah. So, so to preface my remarks, um, I'm reminded of a quote by Maya Angelou, one of our queen ancestors, who said, um, and I'm paraphrasing, that people may not remember um, what you said to me or maybe what you did, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And um, I, I, I brought that up because I think the comments I'm about to make are burning in my heart specifically for medical education, um, because I'm in the medical education um, and training space right now, um, almost finishing up my MD degree. And uh, I think the first thing that I, I wanna say is, is that I think it's critical that if you are in medicine or in biomedical research and you haven't read the medical apartheid, you're wrong. You're wrong, you're fundamentally wrong. Because I think if you don't understand the, the history that black people have been through um, experimentally for us to get to this place in medicine, um, then how are you going to care for those patients and understand their plight from a mistrust perspective as, a, as regards to medicine? If you don't know that, then there's no way you're going to talk to that patient from a perspective that will create a bond of trust 
because you don't understand what they've been through. You don't understand what their grandmother or their grandfather or their ancestors have told them specifically with regards to medicine. Um, so one of the things that I've advocated for at Tulane, um, and obviously I plan on advocating at many other medical schools through the 15 white coast is, is that your medical students and your residents and your faculty should be reading the medical apartheid because they need to understand the history of black people in America and around the world as it regards to, um, to, to medical experimentation. They need to know that because that's where a lot of this mistrust has been fostered from. The other thing that I talked to them about is, is that um, uh, there was a physician who wrote a book called uh, Black Men in White Coats. And he specifically talked about his own experience. He, he's already in the thing. He's already operating in this black skin, but with a white coat on. Um, and I remember specifically him talking about how when he had that white coat on, um, he thought he would have a cape on. Um, and, and there were so many instances where that wasn't the case. And I bring that up because I've talked to my own deans about in medical education, there needs to be this conversation around how do we address situations um, as our non-Black colleagues when we see our Black colleagues being mistreated? Because we can't be the only ones screaming about the issues that are happening. Everyone has to play a role, which I've heard so many people on this panel talk about. If everyone is advocating for it, then people coming into the institution understand that the environment doesn't tolerate racism at all. No one, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Indian, whether you're gay, whether you're straight, no one tolerates it. And so then no one feels comfortable to do it. But the moment they see a, a window of opportunity to feel comfortable doing it around certain people, then you kind of have a cancer festering, right? And you gotta get rid of that. Um, and the last thing I wanna say is, is that, um, I think it's important that we, we do this thing that I, 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 I want to say that it was Dr. Wynn talked about was that it's an and type thing. We all have a role to play. And specifically for the minorities who are, who are really feeling what Dr. Carpenter was talking about earlier, the pain, the, the tiredness, the emotionalism, because we've been dealing with this all our lives. We've been dealing with this every day of our life. This isn't a new thing. This is something we've been dealing with all our lives. We think about it at the dinner table, when we're eating, when we're driving, whatever. Um, remember that a lot of us are tired and we're emotionally drained and it won't hurt for you to take some of that burden off of us. Certain conversations we don't feel like having anymore. Certain conversations we don't feel like talking about anymore. We don't feel like explaining why racism is bad over and over because we're tired of saying it. So sometimes we need our, our other colleagues to speak up for us and say why racism is bad and just let us alone to just enjoy and bask in the presence of someone truly being a real disruptor for us. Because we've been caring, somebody, Killer Mike said, we built this country for free. We're tired, we are genuinely tired and we need for someone else to pick up the anchor and carry it because we are tired. And you know that because you can look at a lot of the chronic issues going on in our communities, whether it's hypertension or cardiomyopathies or whatever, a lot of it is due to stress, psychological stress, because we're dealing with issues that in our actuality, we have the resources in America and around this world to deal with, and we don't have to carry it all on our own. That's, that's my final remarks. Thank you very much, Russell. Um, last and not least, Robert. I'll, I'll keep my uh, remarks brief. I'm reminded in 1933, the inaugural address by FDR at the time where most of us remember the line uh, that got a big applause line, you know, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, on that day, there was another line that was, had a much bigger applause line um, during that period of time. And it's when he faced in, uh, you know, as FDR sort of talked about the emerging challenges, he essentially said, the country needs action and action now. What I would say is that we need action now. Implementation, execution of well-laid plans, well thought off plans, Blue Ribbon Commissions and others have been at the table. We need action. Second, it is no longer okay just to say you're not racist, there be anti-racist. And third, I would say, let's not let the events go in vain, these recent events go in vain. Let's reclaim our best selves. And in that best selves, we will do better. We will impact real lives. But the reality is, I think we are being called now to become and reclaim who we know we should be, which is our best selves. And with that, 
I'll just say I, we've been happy to be on this panel. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I, I have the honor of giving closing remarks. First, it's been an honor to be part of this panel. I want to thank you all for taking a step forward and, and um, being in the panel. I've been touched, I've been inspired, I've learned. I'm really grateful for you sharing your thoughts. There's a lot for us to follow up and that's going to be one of the main initiatives of the next year over for the ACR. This is the time to act and we're going to follow your leads. We're going to take the challenges and we're going to put our best efforts to change what has happened for so many years, for so long. This is not okay. And we have to call the things by their, by their name and we're going to do that. So thank you very much to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.